I'm going to read this morning, just to get us grounded here in the context, from Esther chapter 9, uh, verses 20 through 28. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month Adar and also the 15th day of the same, year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days of sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written for them. For Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pur, that is, cast lots, to crush and to destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore they call these days Purim, after the term Pur. Therefore, because all of this was written in the letter of what they had faced in this matter and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation in every clan, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. You may be seated, please. Now, when I handed this message to Val to make up the slides, and uh, when I mentioned it uh, to a couple of people, their response was interesting and immediate. It was, what in the world does Esther have to do with Christmas? And I might have said the same thing had I not developed this message. And I did not intend to preach this message. I was going to put Esther on a shelf until after Christmas. Today was going to be a more familiar Christmas uh, note to it. But as I was studying ahead, it just kind of leapt out at me that this is a Christmas message. The story of Purim. And uh, I think you will see that as we go along and as we develop it. There's some very interesting parallels that I don't think we're making too much of a stretch of. So what does Esther have to do with Christmas? Well, we will discover that as we go along. Uh, we're dealing here uh, with the institution of a holiday and a feast. And coincidentally, it's a two-day holiday. It starts in the evening on one day and goes into the next. Imagine that. Maybe we could call that Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Who knows? And we shall see as we move along. Uh, Purim, I think, nicely ties with Christmas as it is a time set aside for God's people to remember a great victory when they were delivered from imminent and certain death into a place of rejoicing and dancing and feasting. Purim, as Christmas, is about triumph and celebration. It's about moving from being oppressed under a curse of death to having new life provided for us. Uh, in the case of the Jews, there in, in, in Persia, uh, a couple of folks uh, there provided that for them, right? Uh, Mordecai and Esther, right? And in the case of Christmas, it was our Lord Jesus Christ. Had he not come, had he not lived, had he not died, we would not have eternal life because we would have no way to achieve it because we were under the curse. And the only way to achieve peace with God was to live a perfect life. To obey the law perfectly. Never transgressing, not even an iota. 
And I don't think there's ever been a person who would even claim to have reached that place in their lives. So Purim as Christmas is about triumph and celebration. And so we're going to look at, at three things this morning in regard to this Jewish festival. And I think we can transfer them to our Christian festival of Christmas. We're going to look at the establishment of the holiday. We're going to look at the purpose of the holiday. And we're going to look at the obligation of the holiday known as poor Purim. So the first thing I want to look at is the establishment of Purim. And li listen again here as I read verses 20 and 22. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and, and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Dar and also the 15th day of the same year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that has been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days of sending gifts of food, to one another and gifts to the poor. So the first thing we see is when they are to celebrate Purim. And it's established in the scripture that it's the 14th day of the Jewish month, Adar. Now what does that mean to us? Well, if you wanted to celebrate Purim this year, uh, it will be March 4th and 5th in 2015. Now, uh, if you know anything about Jewish holidays, they move around. You know how Easter moves year to year? Well, theirs do too because they're, they're they use a lunar calendar. And their lunar calendar uh, loses uh, approximately 11 days a year. So they have to have a huge leap year every year. So all everything rotates around a little bit and changes. But, but that's okay. They, they keep track of it well. And, and fortunately, we're on a solar calendar. So the, for the most part, we don't have to, to worry about keeping track of that stuff. But the date is established, and it's to be done on the same date year after year. Okay. Same with Christmas. A date was established, and we celebrated on the same day year after year. Now, there is a difference, and I understand Scripture is not, or Christmas is not mandated in Scripture. There's nowhere in the Bible it says that all you Christians now from year after year will celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ on December 25th. Okay, it's not there. But we have chosen that date. And so that's the date we celebrate our Lord's birth. Purim begins in the evening. Our celebration of Christmas begins in the evening, doesn't it? Christmas Eve, sure. And we'll have a Christmas Eve service here, as will many churches. Uh, some churches, the larger ones, will have multiple Christmas Eve services. And uh, some of them will have a midnight Christmas Eve uh, service. And if you've never been to one of those, they're, they're worth going to. It's, it's a very moving experience. Year by year, annually. Now why? Why does God want them to do this year by year, always at the same time? Because, as human beings, we are prone to forget. All of us are prone to forget. Therefore, we need reminders. We need things to remind us of, of what's going on, of why we do the things we do. So why do they do this? Why do they celebrate? Why do they feast? Because they're remembering the day when their sorrow was turned to gladness. They're remembering the day when their mourning, M-O-U, mourning was turned into a holiday. A day of great rejoicing. They were under the curse of Haman, if you will, with no way out in and of themselves. And so all of humanity... The New Testament tells us all of creation groans under the curse. And so we were with no way out until Jesus came. And then our sorrow was turned to gladness. Our mourning was turned into a holiday. 
Just as Esther and Mordecai rose to confront and defeat the evil that threatened to wipe out God's people, so Jesus came and broke the curse that our world was under. He delivered us from the curse. And so we should rejoice at Christmas. We should be happy. We should give gifts. We should feast. It's all biblical. Why would we not want to rejoice over such a great thing as our salvation? And it's interesting when he tells them how to, to observe it. There in verse 22, make these days of feasting and gladness, days of sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Well, lo and behold, isn't that what we do at Christmas? Some of us feast a little too much, but we feast, and rightly so, and we give gifts. But again, the, the problem is, Because we are still in the flesh, our attention is turned sometimes. And our focus goes from the star Jesus to the tree, or to the candles, or to the presents we're going to either receive or give. Now, all those things are good, let me tell you. At my house, we have four Christmas trees. Two big ones. Two smaller ones. We have lights, we have presents, we have the whole shebang. And we love it all. There's nothing wrong with it. But what we need to remember is the presents represent God's gift of salvation to us. They don't just represent something we got to give to someone or vice versa. The trees, you know, represent the beauty and supposedly point to the sky and Christ and heaven and all of that. And it's all wonderful stuff. As long as we remember that this, all of these things are mere symbols to remind us and help us enjoy what we are really celebrating. And that is the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Which brings us to the purpose of Purim. Was the purpose feasting and gift giving? No. That was the expression, but not the purpose. The purpose was to remember God's great love for his people that he spared them from certain death. And that's the purpose of Christmas. It's to remind us, his people, that God so loved the world that he gave. And so we give at Christmas. It reminds us of the gift God has given to us. We forget sometimes about God's gift to us. And I think at Christmas time especially, we need to be about giving to others some of the things that God has given to us. Now, when I say things, don't think about animate things. I want you to think about inanimate things that God has given to us. And what, what has he given to us? He's given us grace. He's given us mercy. He's given us forgiveness. He's given us acceptance. I want you this Christmas, when you think about the gifts you are going to give, and some of you are planners, as I am, you're already done. You've got all your things purchased in that. But I want you to go beyond those things and think about who is it in your life that you need to give the gift of forgiveness to. Now, I, notice what I did not say. I did not say who is it in your life that deserves for you to give them the gift of forgiveness. Because that's not the way God works, is it? No. No. Think about how it might change your life if you forgave that person or those people. What about if you gave someone the gift of grace, by just being gracious to them? Someone that may rub you the wrong way. Uh, someone that, you know, every time you see them come and you go, oh, geez, I hope they don't talk to me. <laughs> what if we gave them a little grace? 
Gave them some mercy. What about acceptance? You know, there are people we just don't like. What if we gave them the gift of acceptance into our little circles? I would suggest to you that if we were to give those things, it would change us more than it would change them. Because as we give those gifts to those who don't deserve them, we become more Christ-like. Every time we do that, we take a step closer to Christ-likeness. And it's good for us. Acceptance, grace, mercy. Remembrance. Symbols. We need to remember when we gather around the Christmas tree to open our gifts that we thank God first. You know. I think about the Exodus story when uh, the Israelites went out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea. What's the first thing they did when they got to the other side? You remember? They worshiped God. You remember the song of Moses? I will sing unto the Lord for he is triumphed victoriously the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord is God and I will praise him. The horse and rider thrown into the sea. The first thing they did was recognize that it was God who delivered them. It was God who did all of those things. And so they declared that because of those things they would worship him. Unless we stop and take time to recognize and worship, we can forget who is responsible for the holidays. It's God. Yeah. You know, we, we hear a lot now about, don't say happy holidays, say Merry Christmas. Well, I don't know. I remember when I was a little kid, people said happy holidays. I always just assumed they were talking about Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. And that was an expression. So I don't know. I say Merry Christmas too, but we get hung up on things that don't mean anything. They, they aren't really important. Joshua, when he took the people, the children, into the Promised Land, they crossed the river. What did God tell him to do? Build that pile of stones. And he says, the reason is, in years to come, when your children ask you, what does this pile of stones mean? You can tell them. And so it is with our symbols of Christmas. We should have some idea of what they truly represent so when our children ask us, we can tell them. Because they all have a meaning. We don't worship the symbol, but God whom it reminds us of. Finally, the obligation of Purim. Uh, Look here in verse 27. The Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year that these days should be remembered. I would like to just ask you to kind of make that your Christmas verse. And think about it, is that the way you have determined to celebrate Christmas? See, we don't like that word obligated, do we? I don't want to be obligated to anybody. Isn't that what you were told as you were being raised? Don't be obligated to anybody for anything. I'm not obligated to go to church. I'm not obligated to do this. I'm not obligated to do that. Because we just don't like it. But what if you obligated yourself to truly celebrate Christmas as if Christ were the center of it? As if it were truly all about Him? See, to be obligated is to be duty-bound to do something. 
another word that I think we don't use enough anymore is duty. You know, we have, we have a duty to do certain things. In this case, it is the faithful observance of Purim. In our case, it would be the faithful observance of Christmas. You see, too often we observe Christmas and somebody calls to remind us to do it faithfully. <laughs> you see. <laughs> now I want you to notice something here. And, and to me this was, is this was very interesting and it's huge, but you can miss it if you don't look for it. In verse 21, when they're getting instructions about the, how to do this, Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day, etc. Notice, Mordecai did not obligate them to do it. He obliged them. Now there's a huge difference, isn't there, in the meaning of those two words. Obliging someone to do something just means encouraging them to do it, hoping they'll do it, and telling them they can do it if they want to do it. And now we come down here to verse 27. The Jews firmly obligated themselves. You see, this obligation in Christianity is kind of like humbling. In the New Testament, we are urged over and over to humble whom? Ourselves. And so it is here. The Jews obligated themselves to keep this. And so we should. You see, you will not be excluded from heaven if you're a believer in Jesus Christ because you don't faithfully celebrate Christmas. But it would be a good thing if you firmly obligated yourself to do that and do it in a way that exalts Christ. And, and notice now, they didn't just obligate themselves. They firmly obligated themselves. It's like that crossing the Rubicon moment where you say, I'm going to make a commitment here that I'm not going to waver on. I, I, I think about when I decided to, to, go to go to college and I wasn't very bright. And so I, I sold my pickup, I sold my boat, I sold my motorcycle, I sold my car and bought an old junker. And then I went in the living room and I took the, we had, if you're old enough you can remember Magnavox, this big old Magnavox tail. And I took it out and put it in the garage because I knew I wasn't disciplined enough to not watch it. In other words, I got rid of everything that was going to keep me from the possibility of success. You see, I firmly obligated myself to get an education. And, and, and that's what this means. It'll look different for different ones of us. It's an individual thing. But I think too often we make this, this sort of half-hearted commitment to do stuff and then we don't do it. You see, we need to firmly obligate ourselves as the Jews. And I want you to notice something else here now. Because they were God's people, they obligated themselves to always observe Purim in the prescribed manner. Hmm. Why would this admonition even be necessary? It sounds like a pretty good time to me, doesn't it to you? They're feasting, they're having a holiday, they're giving gifts, they're helping out the poor. Sounds pretty good. But as human beings, we have a tendency over time, as I said, to focus, transfer our focus to the symbols at the expense of the meaning behind the symbols. If we don't firmly obligate ourselves to remember it's Jesus Christ. We tend to forget. Now, this, this forgetting is not something that happens as a big event. It's an incremental thing. It's not that somebody gets up one day, uh, kind of like with Santa Claus, and they're all of a sudden they're old enough to understand that Santa Claus is a fictitious character. I know, Brian, I know. <laughs> <laughs> It, but it's an incremental thing. It, years go by, and year after year, we, we transfer a little more and a little more from our 
worship of Christ at Christmas to our worship of, and I'm, I know I'm going to step on some toes here, of family, of friends, of other things that we have in our lives. And I'm f all for those things. I like them all. But at Christmas, Christ should be at the center of our celebration. Ever hear of the war on Christmas? Probably have. The war on Christmas. That's an interesting term. I was reading a paper this morning and Texas, they actually had to pass a law saying it's now legal uh, for kids in school to say Merry Christmas. You can't be sued now for saying Merry Christmas. <laughs> because they had so wiped it out. Hmm. The war on Christmas. Interesting. I'm not talking about what you think. That's not the war on Christmas I'm talking about. The Jews firmly obligated themselves that Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews. In other words, it was God's people who were obligated to observe this festival. You remember, they obligated themselves their children, and to anyone who wanted to join them. The Persians were free to do whatever they wanted to do. Nobody obligated them to do anything. It's God's people who should make sure we observe our festivals and holidays in a way that honors God. It's foolish of us to expect those who are not God's people to do the same as we do. Though a lot of them do. But we should not be offended if they don't. Christmas should never fall into disuse among God's people. God's people. This requires that we teach our children what Christmas means. And all this brings us back to the war on Christmas. Now, I don't give a flip about the war on Christmas that you hear about on TV all the time. Right? Christ's birthday is under no threat of extinction because some department store doesn't let their clerk say Merry Christmas. Now, I don't agree with that, but it doesn't bother Jesus at all. It doesn't move him off his throne one bit. Okay? Yes, there is a war on Christmas, but the enemy is not the Persians, i.e. the enemy is not the secular world out there. We get all indignant when the secular world says, well, we don't want to celebrate it that way. Well, who cares? You can celebrate it any way you want. What we need to be concerned with is how do we celebrate it? What are we teaching our children in the way we celebrate Christmas? What is it if, without saying a word, they come to understand what the importance of Christmas is from our actions and from how we celebrate it? It's foolish to expect non-Christians to act like Christians. It's even more foolish for Christians to act like non-Christians. And that's what happens oftentimes in our Christmas celebration. We don't celebrate Christmas any differently than the non-Christians celebrate Christmas. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, we do exactly the things they do, which is fine. Like I said, Christmas trees, presents, all that stuff, I'm 100% for it. If you want to send me something, I'll give you my address. It's okay. <laughs> But when we make those things the focus of Christmas, we have become just like them. The danger to Christmas is not from the outside. The danger to the church, to, to Christianity, is never from non-Christians. 
If it is, Jesus lied. Because what did he tell Peter? He said, You're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There you go. So you can say this is Christmas, and Jesus is in control of it, and all of the secular stuff in the world isn't going to threaten it. The threat comes from within. The threat comes when God's people, God's people now, you and I, become more enamored with the feasting, the gifts, the trees, the lights, the family traditions, than to celebrating the birth of one who has delivered us from eternal life. Think about that. What's more important to you? You say, oh, we would never do that. <laughs> really. I was listening to Alistair Begg the other day. And he was telling the story of Aunt Meg. And I told this story too. I didn't realize that. I should know that all pastors have this same story. <clears throat> and he said it just irritates him. Now he wasn't talking about Christmas. He was just talking about church attendance in general. And he said it just drives him nuts when somebody comes to him and says, well, pastor, we won't be able to be there this Sunday because Aunt Meg is coming from wherever she's coming from. She's going to be with us and she doesn't particularly like going to church. Well, what message do they send Aunt Meg when they stay home with her instead of going to church? What nonverbal message? And we all know nonverbal messages are really the strongest. They're saying to them, well, Aunt Meg is more important than worshiping Jesus. Now, I know the argument. We say, well, wait a minute. I want, I'm going to witness to Aunt Meg, and, and I don't want her to think I'm a radical. I mean, I, I don't want her to think that I actually worship Jesus at a given point in time with a certain group of people at a scheduled time. I don't want to offend her. Well, you know, what's wrong with, with saying something like, well, Aunt Meg... We're going to church tomorrow and we really hope you come with us. Now which says more about what you really believe? Now, I remember that. That's the kind of house I was raised in. And, and don't get me wrong, I, was, I didn't become a Christian until I was a grown, grown man, 30 years old. But in our house, if you were in our house on Sunday, you went to church with us. That's just what we did. And if you didn't want to go to church, well that was okay. You stay home, we'll see you when we get back. Every pastor has an Aunt Meg story. But, you know, that's not the one that really gets me. Here's the one that really gets me. I can't come to Christmas Eve service, Pastor, because that's our family time. I just want to, you know. <laughs> what are you teaching your kids? You can't tell me that dinner can't wait one hour. Or presents can't wait one hour. What, what would be the message if you said this to your kids and the family and that? Hey, we're going to go to Christmas Eve service and celebrate Christ's birthday. And then we're going to come home and continue the celebration around the tree. What's wrong with that? Or you can go the other way. We don't, but there are lots of churches that have midnight. You know, you can do your whole tree thing first and then do it. But there's one that even gets me worse than that. And I've been doing this long enough to have to go through this a few times, you know. There's a seven, seven day rotation on our calendar. So every seventh year, Christmas comes on what? Sunday. And people say, well, Pastor, I, I'm not going to be able to come to church Sunday because it's Christmas. <laughs> what? <laughs> Can you think of anything more incongruent to saying, I love you with all my heart, soul, and might, Jesus, but it's your birthday, so I can't go to church. <laughs> you know, that's right next to saying I can't go because it's Christmas Eve. Again, I ask you, what message are you sending? You know, in Deuteronomy, where we have the Shema, where, where God is telling the Jewish people that they are to constantly be teaching their children about God. When they get up, when they go to sleep, when they, whatever they're doing, they should be teaching their children. 
Well, when you celebrate Christmas, you're teaching your children what place Jesus Christ takes in your life on the 24th and 25th of December. And unfortunately, oftentimes, he comes up short. Now, in saying all that, I haven't gone off the legal list again. You don't have to do any of that. You can stay home because it's Christmas and still go to heaven. But every time you tell your kids how God is number one in your life, they're going to remember that, well, he's not on the 24th and 25th. You see? The messages we send by what we do transcend and oftentimes negate the messages we send by word of mouth. You see? So don't be an Aunt Meg this Christmas. And I know this is, this is really radical. Just take an hour out of your Christmas Eve or out of your Christmas Day and make sure we, we're celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. What we are teaching our children, our relatives and our friends, is important. Because then when we open our mouths to tell them how important Jesus is, they just might believe us, you see. And the other thing I want to leave you with is remember the gift giving. And remember the gifts. Forgiveness, acceptance, graciousness, love. Try to give, give those gifts to someone. And remember, someone who doesn't deserve it. That's the real key. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for Christmas and how you have indeed made it a day of feasting and rejoicing and family and friends and presents and all those things that we all enjoy. But Lord, it's also an opportunity for, for us to truly witness to those family and friends. To truly let them know that you are number one in our hearts and our souls that we want to serve you with all our might and all our strength. And that on these special two days, as the Jews set aside their two days to celebrate Purim, let us, Lord, firmly obligate ourselves to celebrate Christmas in a way that truly honors you and truly remembers that it's your birth we're celebrating. It's your gifts we are receiving. And then, Lord, ask us what we can give to others, to the poor, and to you. And we'll have the greatest Christmas we've ever had. In Jesus' name, amen.